Trump spends the week calling out China as Hong Kong's freedoms die a little more. Plus, China strikes back. That and more on this week's China News Headlines. Open to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. It's summer, but President Trump isn't on vacation. Okay, he found time to golf. But he's also been very busy with China. The Trump administration piled pressure on China Monday, rejecting nearly all of Beijing's territorial claims in the South China Sea. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, in a statement, called the claims unlawful and denounced China's, quote, campaign of bullying to control them. And Washington regularly sends warships through the area in operations to show what it calls freedom of navigation. U.S. policy had previously been ambiguous and did not take a position on the legality of the competing claims. But Monday's comments reflect a harsher tone. That, of course, infuriated Beijing. We did a full episode on the U.S. government's South China Sea decision on our other channel, America Uncovered. I'll put a link down below. But that was just the beginning. President Trump gave an extended speech in the White House Rose Garden about his favorite topic, China. First, he took aim at Hong Kong. Today I signed legislation and an executive order to hold China accountable for its oppressive actions against the people of Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which I signed this afternoon, passed unanimously through Congress. This law gives my administration powerful new tools to hold responsible the individuals and the entities involved in extinguishing Hong Kong's freedom. We've all watched what happened. Not a good situation. Well, I think Trump can find some things about the Hong Kong situation he enjoys. Trump also announced the end of Hong Kong's special economic status. Today I also signed an executive order ending U.S. preferential treatment for Hong Kong. Hong Kong will now be treated the same as mainland China, no special privileges, no special economic treatment, and no export of sensitive technologies. This new legislation and executive order gives the Trump administration the ability to sanction Chinese officials and banks over abuses in Hong Kong. And that was all in just the first two minutes of the speech. Ladies and gentlemen, the president is just warming up. No administration has been tougher on China than this administration. We imposed historic tariffs. We stood up to China's intellectual property theft at a level that nobody's ever come close. We confronted untrustworthy Chinese technology and telecom providers. We convinced many countries, many countries, and I did this myself for the most part, not to use Huawei because we think it's an unsafe security risk. Wow, he did it all himself. Now, okay, the Trump administration did up the pressure on Huawei by saying the countries that use it will risk their U.S. business ties. But the U.S. has been calling out Huawei since at least 2012, during the Obama administration. It's actually one of those things Trump and Obama kind of agree on. But I can see why Trump didn't mention that, because he then switched over to attacking Joe Biden, Obama's former vice president, for being soft on China. Joe Biden's entire career has been a gift to the Chinese Communist Party and to the calamity of, of errors that they've made. They made so many errors. Yeah, calamity of errors. Actually, in his hour-long speech, the first three minutes were about China, and the rest was spent criticizing Biden and the Democrats. You know, it's an election year. And listening to a politician criticize another politician during campaign season is so normal. It's like the most normal thing that has happened this entire year. Frankly, it was a relief. And then the bears came. Anyway, China really has become a bipartisan issue. The U.S. is taking a much stronger stance against the Chinese Communist Party. If you'd like to know more, we did a recent episode about the seven ways the U.S. has been ramping up pressure on China over on America Uncovered. Yeah, okay, the lines sometimes blur between these two shows. Maybe we should just make one mega show called 
Chimerica Unsencoved. Never mind, that's a terrible idea. Separately from the Rose Garden speech, President Trump has announced that he is no longer interested in a trade deal with China. And the reason? The coronavirus. We made a great trade deal, but as soon as the deal was done, the ink wasn't even dry, and they hit us with the plague. To be fair to the Chinese Communist Party, I don't think they timed the coronavirus outbreak to mess with the trade deal. Of course, the Chinese Communist Party is getting really, really mad about everything the Trump administration is doing. They vowed retaliation over the Hong Kong sanctions, pain for the UK Huawei ban. They even made this mean old cartoon of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, which was a bit ham-fisted, especially compared to Pompeo's tweet about his dog's favorite toys. But in response to all the sanctions, the Chinese Communist Party has launched into one of its favorite tactics. If you hit me, I'll hit you back. They're sanctioning Lockheed Martin over a recent arms sale to Taiwan. Devastating especially as Lockheed Martin has very little exposure to China. And after the U.S. said last week it would sanction Chinese officials over the persecution of Uyghurs, China said it would sanction U.S. lawmakers, including Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is totally broken up about it. Marco Rubio is devastated as well. But I'm proud of that ban because it shows we're on the right side. Anytime a totalitarian and evil regime is against you, you know you're on the right side. So China is trying to hit back, but it seems like they're not hitting back very hard. But they do hit back at individual foreigners, usually in the most petty ways. Chris Buckley is a New York Times reporter, and he's been forced to leave Hong Kong because authorities refused to renew his journalist visa, which is exactly what mainland China did to him back in 2012 and again two months ago. So Hong Kong is becoming more and more like the mainland. And a lot of Hong Kong residents are nervous about just that. Which may explain why over the weekend, a record-breaking 600,000 Hong Kongers turned out to vote in primary elections. That's more than triple what organizers were hoping for. Now these primary elections were organized by Hong Kong's pro-democracy parties. They wanted Hong Kongers to vote for which pro-democracy candidates should run in the Legislative Council elections, which are in September. So these were unofficial primaries that were strategically designed to prevent the pro-democracy parties from splitting the vote. And because they had never held a primary before, organizers were hoping to get 170,000 people to vote. But 600,000 showed up, and that's thanks largely to the Hong Kong police. Just before the vote, police raided the offices of the Public Opinion Research Institute, a polling company that was helping to organize the primary. And nothing will turn people out to vote like trying to stop them from voting. However, none of that matters anymore because the Communist Party is now trying to criminalize voting. You see, the pro-democracy parties are trying to get a majority of seats in the Legislative Council. That's more than 35 out of 70 seats, which is almost impossible because half of the seats are chosen by votes from special interest groups that are largely pro-Beijing. But they actually have a slim shot at it this year, which is why the pro-democracy parties are running what they call a 35-plus campaign to get that majority, which is why they held those primaries. Now, Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam said that the primaries and this whole 35-plus campaign might be illegal under the new national security law. I would just to put down a further note of warning. If this so-called primary uh, election's uh, purpose is to achieve the ultimate goal of um, uh, delivering a, what they call a 35-plus with the objective of uh, objecting to, resisting every policy initiative of the Hong Kong ASEAN government, then it may fall into the category of subverting the state power, uh, which is now one of the four types of offenses under the new national security law. In other words, trying to get a majority of seats in the legislature could be a crime under the national security law. 
That's also why Chinese officials are now calling the primaries illegal. So it sounds like the elections in September should be fun. Speaking of Hong Kong, the NBA. Remember when there was a huge scandal because Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey tweeted in support of the Hong Kong protests and China asked the NBA to fire him? The NBA did not fire him, but they're still trying to repair their business in China. And this week, people discovered that the NBA's online shop would let you customize jerseys with phrases like, F the police, but not free Hong Kong. Outrage ensued, and the NBA relented. So now, you can buy your free Hong Kong jersey. I hope every NBA game will be an ocean of fans wearing free Hong Kong jerseys. That is, if people are ever allowed to attend sports games again. I can't wait until we all go back to doing normal things like that. Until the bears come. Thanks for watching China Uncensored. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.